but it's great that you're here. And we don't make the assumption that everybody who comes to our meetings are believers. Um, we know that um, because we ourselves, some of us, came from non-Christian backgrounds, our colleagues around the world, we've, some of them had a Christian upbringing, some of them came from atheism, some of them came from a position of theistic evolution, believing God somehow used evolution. And so consequently, we make no assumption and uh, we hope that what we share is useful. People are amazing, features that could not evolve. I did this talk for a conference some years ago and um, it's not really something I do very often, but I hope it will be useful to you. I'm going to just fetch something out of my laptop bag. A uh, little mouse. Now, just very quickly, if you don't know about the ministry, Gavin's already mentioned our website, and do go to that resource. You'll find, if you go to the page, front page at the moment, creation.com, that there is a mention of a European creation conference. <coughs> And there are some flyers for that here. And 14 speakers. We've got speakers from representing, I think, six European countries. And uh, so it's truly a European conference. We've had two of these. We've had, in 2016, about 1,000 people, nearly that in 2018. It was due to be in 2020, the third one. But of course, COVID saw to that. Uh, but God willing, we'll be having that in 2022, September. And do make a point of coming if you find this sort of thing useful and interesting. It's a great way of connecting with like-minded people from all over the world. We actually had people from Australia and South Africa last time, uh, 20 countries represented mainly across Europe. So it's very much a European conference and there's uh, subjects right across the spectrum. So that fly there will tell you more about it. There's a new featured article six times a week and to give you a, a, a really a handle on some of the things we've been sharing in the previous fortnight. Every two weeks we send out a newsletter, free newsletter by email, bite-sized bits of information, such as you see here, called Infobytes. And that means you can click on those. If you find the article useful, you can read it and send it to somebody else. And that's what we encourage you to do. It's a great way of sharing with friends who may not have the same position as you. Uh, provoke a conversation. Very easy way to get that going. So if that would be useful to you, Gavin's just going to pass on a form that looks like that. Pop your uh, email address there. That's all you need to do, really. If you want to also find about, out about meetings happening in your area, just put your postcode as well. And we'll only target you when we have a meeting within a sort of 20, uh, probably a 40 mile radius of your area, okay? But um, that's a free newsletter. You can easily unsubscribe at the click of a button it's not essential for you to uh, keep getting it if you find your inbox is getting too full. But we can only scratch the surface. Gavin scratched the surface of the topic of the age of the earth and of geology and of rocks and uh, of the relevance to Christian faith. And what I want to do is talk about people's amazing abilities and how actually from, an ev from a Christian perspective but also from a biological perspective because I'm a trained biologist I see that this does not and cannot be explained by slow and gradual evolutionary processes. Well, bear with me. I'm sure, like me, you'll have watched things on the television, perhaps you've watched them online, of um, amazing feats, abilities of people, talented human beings. Perhaps some spectacular acrobat or parkour, do you know about that? I mean, if I was a teenager today, I'd be a parkour person, running around the urban environment, tossing myself off buildings. I, I, I absolutely loved doing that sort of thing. I did it on the seashore. But they do it in the urban environment. I'm not uh, advocating you break in and do some of the slightly more nefarious things they do, but incredibly talented. They're amazing athletes. And then there are people who are brilliant at maths, people who are brilliant at, in technical ways with their minds. Um, some stupendous feat of memory, perhaps you've been impressed by that in the past, or some astonishing um, ability at engineering. Some people have awesome technical minds. And then there are people, of course, with tremendous musical ability. We're familiar with people who, who and maybe you're one of them, who can play instruments incredibly well. Gifted, we might talk about someone being a prodigy as a child. We're also familiar with people with brilliant artistic skills. Perhaps you've marveled at an art gallery as you viewed incredible sculptures um, or paintings, master artists. Does anybody like going around 
I don't know, the, um, the Tate in London or the National Gallery or anything up here in this neck of the woods. Or you've watched a professional calligraphist at work and you've just marvelled at their ability to <coughs> write in amazing ways. And we mustn't forget, of course, that although writing books doesn't seem amazing, to view a person writing or tapping away on a word processor doesn't, doesn't look amazing, but somebody's writing ability, if they're marvellous at prose or poetry, can have the listener or the reader spellbound. Amazing abilities that humans have. Changing tact, there are developments in our modern world that we marvel at. We think of the ingenuity, the brilliance of gifted men and women who are responsible for just things that blow our minds. Almost it seems to us like magic what they're able to do. Uh, we hear of great innovations in medicine and in science generally. Um, we also live in a day of stupendous feats of civil engineering such as the Burj Khalif Tower in Dubai. I've just about seen it when I've stopped on an Emirates flight in Dubai and looked out the airport window and just about seen the tower but I mean this tower's over all of the normal skyscrapers. 828 metres, that's about half a mile tall above the city of Dubai and the tower, the Jeddah Tower in Saudi Arabia, if they ever finish it, will be a thousand metres tall, a kilometre tall. This is something humans do. Here's, an, here's another one, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, um, amazing suspension bridges all over the world, massive long tunnels, um, I don't know if you've ever come across this structure, the vessel it's called. 154 flights of stairs and 80 landings in that structure there on the right hand side. That's a close up at a place called Hudson Yards in New York. And a bit of architectural fun. If you ask why, well, <laughs> I'm sure if you went there and if you felt fit you would walk all over it, wouldn't you? <laughs> Tremendous. And then of course, um, we're over half a century on now from the first moonwalk. At least I believe we walked on the moon. With spacecraft regularly being launched to explore planets and moons and asteroids of the solar system. Experiments form, uh, performed in, on the International Space Station in a weightless environment to investigate uh, effects on plants and so on. And even planned tourist trips to the very edge of Earth's atmosphere to experience space and weightlessness just for a short time, as has already begun. A few celebrities have already done that, SpaceX and so on. What's the point? The point is, people really are amazing in their achievements. And uh, that's something that I guess is not controversial. But it is controversial if you say, what is the source of it all? Where did it come from? And that is a seriously controversial question if you dare to say, well, in our modern world, I believe the only rational explanation is an intelligent designer, a creator, uh, made us. And uh, I make no apology at the start if, with just giving you some scripture. Thus says the Lord, Cursed be the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength and whose heart departs from the Lord. The Bible often sets uh, at odds the idea of trusting in God, trusting in man. Trusting in the divine, realising our smallness, trusting in the arm of flesh. Humanism, or which is really a man-centred philosophy, where we make our decisions without recourse to the supernatural, or recognising my smallness, my finite, finiteness, what does God say? It's crucial to heed the warnings of Scripture. The Bible is clear that to place ultimate trust in man is to idolise man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Now a Christian believer will, will, will say amen to that, but um, a lot of people will honestly think, as they look at human achievements, we don't need God. Look at what we've achieved, and you're telling us in the 21st century we need to recognise the divine. Bonkers. Nonsense. Well, let's actually think about this. We will want to add emphatically, if we're Christians, that whilst it's marvellous what humans can do, we should recognise the one who made the humans who do the amazing things. He's more marvellous. And uh, Christians will recognise that God's saints, God's people, will sing in the coming world, the world to come, the glory, 
Great and marvellous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. In other words, we'll give the credit, the glory, the adulation, the praise, not ultimately to man, though we give credit where credit's due, but ultimately to God, who made man. Just as if you, you might praise the, um, the car, you might say, well, this, great, this amazing sports car, this Maserati, or, I don't know, Bugatti, Veyron, or whatever it is that floats your boat. Isn't that amazing? And then you look at the engineers who made the car, they're surely deserving the credit. Or even the car factory, think about the car factory, it has to be much more sophisticated than the, than the cars it builds. So whilst one of those sports cars may look amazing, the factory that, mil that turns out those cars is actually more incredible, more sophisticated. It stands to reason. And rightly, therefore, praise ultimately belongs to God for the amazing things we see. But right here we can hit a wall of criticism. Because in our secular Western world, people don't want that message. We're not the creation of God. Instead, they dogmatically insist, we are we evolved animals, very highly evolved animals. Naturalistic processes operating over countless millions of years can accomplish the design or the apparent design that we see in the world without the need for God. Science proves that. Don't you realize they say Darwin and his successors have made God irrelevant? During the last century and more, this anti-creation, anti-God viewpoint has come to dominate. This is the title of a film from 1923, Evolution. You probably haven't heard of it. I don't think it was necessarily a big hit at the time. Many Christians have been duped into thinking that origins is a settled issue. Uh, or that, alternatively, origins is neutral as far as faith is concerned. Now, Gavin has shared a number of things that should put that to bed uh, in the first session. Now, some atheists have admitted, nevertheless, that um, evolution is atheism by the back door. In other words, if you really understand what modern evolutionary biology teaches, there are no goals, no goal-directed forces of any kind. You're born, you suffer, you die, that's it, fini. You might become fertilizer, but there is nothing beyond the grave. And uh, for a lot of people, evolution is the foundational belief to their humanistic, maybe atheistic worldview. A lot of people would have a, a view in between, of course, that says somehow we can say that science tells us how it all happened, the Bible we look to for, for big picture issues of why we're here. But I want you to think about how those amazing human ability, abilities I mentioned earlier have gradually evolved. Skillful art or musicianship or mathematical prowess, for example. How did these things get fixed into the human genome as something that would become expressed in human beings as they reproduce over the generations. According to the theory's architects and main proponents, evolution supposedly selects that which increases the likelihood of having lots of surviving offspring possessing your <coughs> useful, lucky, advantageous mutations or your, um, your features. But what use could such abilities have had for our supposed distant ancestors back in the past? Before People had pianos or typewriters or all the other sophisticated things that we have. That's the thing to think about. Well, I want you to think about this. According to evolutionary anthropologists, about seven million years ago, an ape-like ancestor of ourselves and chimpanzees began to diverge into two branches. Okay? Only about seven million years ago, and in that supposed seven million years, seven million years is a blink of time really compared to the billions of years we're talking about. Ever since that time, novel characteristics have gradually arisen through accidental genetic innovations, what we call mutations. They've somehow been fixed into the genetic material of our evolving ancestors, they've been naturally selected, and they have become fixed in the genome over time. So that, in our modern day, we are much more sophisticated than our ancestors were. And that's you think about this, I want you to connect what we've often heard about mutations and natural selection with these amazing human abilities. And here we've got a man who's looking at these amazing things he sees on, sees on YouTube, he says, unbelievable! All that I'm seeing confirms that the human body and the mind are simply the result of unplanned accidental mistakes. Is that 
logical? Is that coherent? To think that amazing things come from accidents, unplanned, unguided, non-designed origins. We'd never accept that in any other walk of life. Every single aspect of our physical makeup, our mental capacity, our psychological constitution must have somehow originated by accidental mutations with no plan of forethought or purpose. That's what we're supposed to believe in evolutionary terms. Really? I'm not laughing at people who hold that view. I'm saying it's a very big ask. <laughs> so let's, for a few minutes, showcase a few amazing things that people do. Absolutely stunning things that people do. And we'll see that some of these things, frankly, fly in the face of evolution. If you think in terms of how they would have got here by accidents being fixed in the human DNA over time. Hopefully you'll enjoy some of these things, what we might call the wow factor. The subtitle of my talk says, features that could not evolve. And I'm talking about humans. Abilities and achievements that men and women are able to do, and children too, that could not evolve. Things that are either irrelevant to human survival, therefore they would have had no bearing on uh, the ability of a, an, uh, one ancestor to live longer or produce more offspring. Or things that far surpass what evolution would have needed to fix in place to enable this hominid to survive better than the next hominid. <laughs> to live longer, to produce more offspring like itself. Let's start with maths. Among the finest living mathematicians, many of his peers regard Professor Terence, or Terry Tao, uh, of UCLA in the States, as a top maths mind today. Some have dubbed him the Mozart of mathematics. He's 45 years old now, got his PhD when he was just 20. Actually, he published his first research at 15 years old, which is pretty amazing. He's written over 350 papers and authored, authored 18 textbooks. <coughs> He's only in his mid-40s, and uh, he's originated many conjectures and theorems in the maths world. But what use has such high-level mathematics in survival terms? How did the brain evolve to such a level so that in recent um, uh, centuries people could do such incredible things? A mathematical ability of such exceptional prowess is not going to help you with brute survival, is it? Let's face it. Well, we'll take up some of these questions later. Now, most of us would go glazy-eyed if I showed you on YouTube or some other clip a top mathematician performing on the screen some difficult, fiendishly difficult theorem. I'm not going to do that. But there are many maths abilities that are more interesting. Let me introduce you to 25-year-old Winnie Ngumi, a medical student at University of Nairobi at the time uh, of this um, video I'm going to show you. She's in Kenya. And soon after arriving at university, she discovered she had this extraordinary talent with numbers that she really didn't understand that was a talent before. Um, she hadn't realised that it was in any way exceptional. But it is exceptional. In fact, she's like a human calculator. And here she is in action in 2019 as she uses her gift of what she calls mental maths. I can get there. Oops. Chingli solves every mathematical problem presented to her with ease. 142576. And in record time, at times providing answers with precise accuracy, and believe it or not, she even does it faster than a calculator. Six foot five divided by seven. 14,092. Now, as I said, later on, I'll say a little bit more about people's mathematical abilities in relation to origins, okay? But for now, I put it to you that such abilities as Winnie's fly in the face of an evolutionary explanation. In other words, fixing such ability, such way beyond the what's necessary for survival into a person's brain through fixing it in the DNA. Then there's artists, amazing art. Well, art is a matter of taste. One man's meat is another man's poison. 
But we all acknowledge that some artists are truly brilliant. We could acknowledge many masters from the past about uh, whom their fans wax lyrical. Maybe a Rembrandt or Michelangelo or Turner or a Jura, whatever is your, uh, you know, floats your boat as it were. Or Leonardo da Vinci perhaps. But while many articles, uh, artists have had skills honed over the, uh, you know, the childhood, the advice of parents and other tutors, in few cases people just developed abilities without, where they came from nowhere. Okay? Their parents might not have had an artistic bone in their bodies, as it were, and suddenly you have this prodigy. Such a person is Archiana Krameric. Her desire to paint and her amazing artistic skill didn't come from her parents at all. She's 26 now, but, and she's an accomplished poet, but we're going to focus on her art. Even at five years old, she had an artistic ability, notice what I said, five years old, an artistic ability way beyond most adults. Okay, aged eight, she was producing world-class large oil paintings and was entirely self-taught. By the time she was 13, her papers, uh, paintings had made her famous and had the world reeling. And this is a short snippet from a YouTube video about um, Akiana. Thirteen-year-old art prodigy, Akiana Krameric, absolutely believes that her God-given talent is behind her extraordinary success. Well, that's one of her mo more recent paintings, and I think you'd agree that's pretty stunning. Just look her up. I mean, she's, I could have chosen other people. The question is, what possible reason, what scientific explanation could you give for how human ancestors evolved such amazing abilities? What evolutionary advantage would possessing such an artistic ability give? What edge would it give you in terms of brute survival? Which is what matters in terms of natural selection in an evolutionary sense? Just how could genetic mutations have fixed such ability into an evolving population of hominids? What about magnificent musicianship? We're sport for choice. Which instrument do we use? Which t style of music? Well, for sheer technical brilliance, I'm going to choose a concert pianist. Um, someone who can play lots of notes quickly from a classical music score very, very quickly. One of Be Beethoven's uh, sonatas, maybe, or a piece of Liszt, if you know anything about classical music. Some of these things are extremely technical. Um, Chopin, maybe, or Mozart, the list goes on. Well, you won't have heard, perhaps, of Costantino Carrera. Uh, he's someone most of you will uh, not follow. He's a very capable pianist. I've chosen this clip simply because he does a lot of popular piano pieces on YouTube, and he's actually um, just talented. And this just gives you a little flavor. So as I'm saying, I'm not saying he's the best pianist around, but he's clever. And um, there are phenomenal uh, pianists, there are phenomenal musicians all over the world, virtuosos we call them, don't we? In the case of the top concert pianists, they can play 16 notes in a second. I don't mean plonk all six, uh, you know, 16 notes down at once, I mean play 16 discernible notes <laughs> within a second, where up to 10 keys can be pressed in an instant. That's nothing impressive. But when you play according to a score, having practiced that many notes, the dexterity is incredible. So the fastest pianist allegedly can approach 20 notes per second. It's not actually that impressive when you listen to it because your ear can no longer discern. It begins to sort of merge and, uh, that's, you know, into one. But think about it. What possible use could some, the beginning, some incipient manual dexterity in a hominid ancestor have given it in terms of survival. Yeah, you're probably getting a bit irritated by that, so I'll stop it. Okay, well as, as with other terrifically talented people we've already showcased, ask yourself how that could be selected for. Okay, a species that could ab was able to le learn to read music, a sophisticated language in itself, and interpret it with manual dexterity to boot, 
before it would ever be necessary. It had to be fixed in evolutionary terms so that in the last few centuries humans could do that sort of thing. The pianoforte wasn't even invented until, it wasn't even known in Mozart's time, there was only harpsichords then. And um, already people can play these things in a marvellous way. What about gymnastics? I'm just picking a few human abilities for fun. Uh, this is the European Youth Olympic Festival team as they performed in Hungary in 2017. They were aged between 14 and 17 years old. Amazing agility and grace. Uh, whatever piece of apparatus, whether it's even you know, a piece of the rings or the bars or the uh, parallel bars or the floor routine, I think it's tremendous watching uh, gymnasts, male and female. Of course, they train long and hard to do the brilliant things they do. This talented young man is Elliot Brown. He took silver medal for men's tumbling in the finals of the 2018 World Championships in St. Petersburg. And then again, he retained his medal the following year in Tokyo. Now, in case some of you don't know what I mean by tumbling, let's have a look. Well, what enables them to do such amazing feats? Training, absolutely, lots and lots of training. But for, for, for sure, before you even get to the training, there's the design of the human body, isn't there? The musculoskeletal system, par excellence, we would say, working perfectly with the nervous system, the brain, all powered by oxygen and glucose that's brought through the circulatory system and so on and so forth. All of these body systems have to be not just good enough, but way beyond what is needed for sheer survival to do the kind of things they do. And they do. Again, what possible use would such the fixation of such abilities somehow latently within our DNA so they weren't perceived and wouldn't be used until thousands of years later, tens of thousands of years later, what possible use would that give? There needs to be an explanation. Otherwise, the shoe is on the other foot. For those who believe in evolution are believing these things happened somehow. But that's the science of the gaps. Now, we would point to an all-powerful God, if we're Christians, and say, well, that's divine design. That might seem a cop-out to some people, but at least we admit that, that we're just putting the design back to an intelligent, all-powerful, all-knowing creator. But if we're going to put this down to super, uh, uh, natural processes alone, we need an explanation. So we've showcased some of these things. We've agreed, I hope, that people are amazing. Their minds, their bodies, the wonderful things that they can do. Um, such talents, by the way, don't enable them to feed themselves better. They don't enable them to survive better. They don't make them more fecund, which means more reproductively fit, therefore producing more offspring. And yet, there they are, all these amazing abilities. Perhaps you've never thought about it. How did these things get there? If evolution was true, humans evolved from ancestors who in turn evolved from more primitive hominids still. Every single one of these things must somehow be explained as having arisen by natural, non-supernatural processes without any intelligence. And you have to jump through hoops to come to some sort of explanation like that. Isn't such a belief really a science of the gaps? I would go so far to say, maybe a bit offensively to some, it's a blind faith. Evolution needs an explanation. We'll take a close look at human creativity and, bl and brilliance a bit later. But how far back would you have to go in, evo in the evolutionary story to find evidence for such things? That's the secular way of thinking that mankind has arisen from an ape-like ancestor something like six or seven million years ago, as I mentioned earlier, and has over time become homo sapiens, the naked upright ape 
and yet we share kinships with chimps that can't do any of these things. Lewis Dartnell is Professor of Science Communication at the University of Westminster, a writer of books and for newspapers. He appears on TV programs. I don't know if you've heard him. I've read his book, The Origins, How the, World, How the Earth Made Us. It's a, quite a subtle title, isn't it? And he writes this. It took three million years for hominins making chip stone tools for humans to smelt the first copper, yet we progress from the Iron Age to space flight in just 3,000 years. Yeah? That's what many evolutionists will claim. And uh, the idea of that should open our eyes to the fact that something is deeply wrong with evolutionary theory. Why does it take so long to get to the simple beginnings and then advance so quickly? That's never been explained, by the way. And this advanced ability that we're considering, in whether it's maths or music or uh, uh, in any other area, needs to be explained. Now, if you go back to the so-called Stone Age, um, then you, you're going back maybe up to three million years, according to the evolutionary <coughs> time frame. <coughs> Human cognition, the ability to think and be intelligent and have a big brain and do complicated things, is supposed to have come from our ape-like ancestors during a gradual course of evolution. We start with simple stone tools, and then we make innovations and suddenly there's this explosion of innovation a few thousand years ago when we start going from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age and eventually the Space Age. This man, Professor Nicholson, is a business psychologist and journalist. He's an evolutionary anthropologist and people like him believe that no brain evolution has taken place, listen to this carefully, no significant evolution of the brain has taken place since about 8000 BC. In other words, since about 10,000 years ago. The success of Homo sapiens was no fluke, he says. Much of their brain's programming was already in place and an, an inheritance from pre-human ancestors. Their world changed radically with the invention of agriculture approximately 10,000 years ago, the so-called Neolithic. Which means the brain evolved much further back in time. But what it the, by the time you go back 10,000 years, you would find a person with a brain pretty much as it is today. Same architecture, same neurons, same wiring, same number of um, your, um, neurons in the, in the cerebral hemispheres, and the same basic wiring. So how much further do you have to go back? Well, Edward Hagen, another evolutionary anthropologist at Washington State University, he says that humans cannot have evolved during the last 10,000 years. I want to just underline this point. <coughs> evolutionary psychologists downplay the possibility that significant cognitive evolution, in other words, the invention of braininess, <laughs> in the 10,000 of the years so or so since the advent of agriculture, for reasons of both science and political correctness. Scientifically, 10,000 years, that's about 500 generations, is not much time for natural selection to act. Okay? And it certainly isn't enough time to evolve new complex adaptations, sophisticated mechanisms coded for by numerous genes. Okay? So the reasoning goes like this, if you listen carefully. About 50,000 years ago, humans had become too dispersed geographically across the world as it is today for there to be any longer significant evolution of human beings in terms of their brain because they were no longer together. So when you look at people all over the world, they have reached already by 50,000 years ago in their scheme of thinking a brain much as it is today. We've already moved back now from 10,000 to 50,000 years. Okay, so how far back can you go and still find something substantially like our brain according to evolutionary theorists? That's where you'd find the first sparks of human brilliance that enable people to develop brains that hundreds, uh, thousands of years later enable them to do the amazing things we've seen. Well, it turns out not just 10,000 years, not even 50,000 years, but likely we have to go back at least 200,000 years, perhaps even more. Now, the average person has a whopping 16 billion neurons, brain cells, in your cerebral cortex, your big hemispheres here. Great apes have at best half that number. Now, it's me not merely the number of neurons that matters, it's the way they're organized, your architecture, the way they're wired, if you like. And this lady, Dr. Susanna Herculana Husel, 
if I've pronounced the name correctly, she's a Brazilian uh, neuroscientist. She says, given what we've learned in my lab about how brain size relates to numbers of neurons within and across species, it means that the first modern human of 200,000 years ago most likely already had the same 16 billion neurons in the cere cerebral cortex that we do today. In other words, 200,000 years ago, a human being had the same wiring, the same brain architecture as we do today, according to that theory. Now, I don't believe in the 200,000 years, but then in the last 200,000 years has been very modest, if anything, a very modest change in the, in the brain wiring. Now, this is a big ask. In other words, we're saying that at least 200,000 years ago, already was fixed in the brain the ability to do all the stuff we've considered amazing before it would ever be possible for people to do those things. They would already have had the ability, with training, with education, to be brilliant gymnasts, to be brilliant typewriters, if there's such a word, brilliant uh, mathematicians, um, brilliant everything else. Really? Does that seem logical to you? In other words, 0.2 million years, not 0.2 million years, 200,000 years. Hominid ancestors could have done everything you can do now, according to evolutionists, but for <coughs> teaching them and learning them, uh, and, and them learning these things. I think that's evidence against human evolution, not for evolution. If evolutionists are correct, just how was that potential selected for and fixed so early before it gave any survival advantage? How did that happen? Because evolution cannot anticipate the future and fix in place now stuff that's going to be useful 200,000 years from now. It has to give an advantage now. Otherwise, useful, lucky mutations are weeded out. They're lost by the very process of natural selection. It sorts out, it loses stuff that doesn't do any good. It's like rust building up on your car. It's not a good thing. So, I think it's actually wishful thinking in the extreme to believe that human abilities such as we've considered uh, could have evolved. To the unprejudiced, the available scientific evidence, I think, doesn't support the idea of primitive ancestors of man thousands of years ago. I know that I'm only presenting it from one point of view, but um, if that was true, then already, long, long ago, we're to believe that there was genius. It just didn't get used for any purpose. Now, when you turn to the scripture, you see something so different. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1. <coughs> so Bible teaching cannot be married with the idea of some kind of evolution of intelligent and ingenious hominids over hundreds of thousands of years. Advocates of theistic evolution, those who say God somehow used evolution, always see those hominids back in time, our, our supposed ancestors, as soulless, people without souls. Would you expect people without souls to be able to do amazing musical, mathematical, and every other uh, ability that we've, we've considered? No. The ability to do those things is the sign that we're made in the image of God. So it makes no sense that our soulless ancestors, allegedly, had the same wiring and could have done all of those same things without even having a soul. But such is the compromise of theistic evolution. Alistair McGrath is a theistic evolutionist. Nevertheless, I do applaud his astute observations in this particular book, which I read about three years ago. And he says the following. A common theme in ev contemporary evolutionary biology is that human cognitive capacities, your braininess, your ability, evolved <laughs> primarily for the purposes of survival. We did not need to solve complex cosmological problems in order to get by from one day to the next. Just as well, isn't it? <laughs> um, indeed, one of the mysteries that evolutionary accounts of human capacities have to confront is that our cognitive uh, capacities vastly exceed those required for mere survival. We're far too clever, we've, we're over-designed. We can do so many amazing things that just aren't needed for brute survival. And he takes the example as the, uh, the remarkable success of mathematics. Now, in a longer version of this talk, I talk about how evolutionary theory theorizers imagine how calculus, the ability to do calculus, 
complex calculus evolved from uh, simple beginnings somehow in the human brain. Ernst McGrath says, no, that doesn't make sense. Even as a theistic evolutionist, he admits that that doesn't make sense. Why? Because we're created, not evolved, we're created in the image of God. That's the explanation for where those amazing abilities come from. So I say again, people really are amazing, and those features could not evolve. There's certainly no evidence, no one tries to attempt, no one attempts, I should say, to explain where those things could have come from. And the stark truth is that, and I would say this without any apology, that evolution has become a kind of idol that people worship instead of acknowledging the creator God of the Bible as the source of all of these things. Scripture is full of exhortations to turn from idolatry, and I'm including here, I'm including the idol of hominid to man evolution over time. To me that's an idol, that people, they, 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 they bow to before that instead of acknowledging God created us in his image. And here are two examples from Scripture, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, showing that this is idolatry. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. If we rebel against God's word, what he's clearly revealed about the origin of man, then we are idolaters. And Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 10, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Even in advanced academic textbooks, I see the language of idolatry. People saying that nature did this, with a capital N. Evolution does that. Which is just a secular substitute for saying, God has done this, or God has done that. If you think about it, it's idolatry. It might not look like it, people aren't bowing before a physical idol, but it's a form of idolatry. Ask yourself, what does evolution uh, hold, does evolution still have on the thinking of people you know, perhaps on your own thinking? I came from a position of evolution myself. What, does, what hold does it have on the thinking of your friends, your family, your work colleagues? Such that they think, well, evolution is my way of thinking and understanding the world, therefore I don't have time for religion. As if somehow I've explained the, the reason for religion away. I don't need God. Well, here we see Paul writing to the Thessalonian Christians, and he says, Your faith toward God has gone out, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. In other words, as Paul and his compatriots brought the gospel to these, Christ these people in Thessalonica, they turned from their idolatry, and they turned instead to the living God, as the one that they would worship. And I think the same applies in a modern day. I started at the beginning, if you remember. I said, who's really getting the glory? Ultimately, I mean. Give credit where credit's due, but does God get the ultimate glory? Society usually stops at praising man, praising the woman, praising the child who's got this amazing ability, praising evolution even. But we need to worship and glorify God. We need to give him the glory. Jesus himself said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve, Luke 4, 8. And the writer to the Hebrews exhorts Christians with these words, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. May I encourage you this evening to do just that and to encourage others to do just that. By all means celebrate human accomplishments, but let's not forget the one who created human beings, who endowed us with our minds and who ultimately deserves the credit, the glory as the gift giver, the giver of those amazing abilities. Finally, and most importantly, let's move on from talking about the gifts that people possess, enabling, enabling them to do amazing things. And let's consider not just our minds, our bodies, or our capacity for amazing feats, but rather the gift of God's beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to make atonement, to cover up our sins, to <coughs> make us clean, to forgive us, to make a, God, a way back to the God that we have become alienated from because of our rebellion, who we have offended, and from whom, unless we have a reconciler, we are alienated forever. For the wages of sin is death, that's the bad news. But the good news is, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God has made a way back to himself. The Creator has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ as the Saviour. If you acknowledge these words to be true, then 
you as a sinner can find your way back to God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Well, I hope you'll explore further. Just a few pointers. There's not really a book on this talk or a resource on the book table. But I mentioned the amazing design of the human body. That book by Professor Stuart Burgess at Bristol University, The Design and the Origin of Man, shows the amazing concept of the design of the human body. I recommend that to you. Um, if you're wondering, what do other scientists think about these things? Well, here are 10 PhD scientists I've pulled together from different walks of life, different scientific backgrounds, some of them connected with our ministry, some of them who work in their own institutions. And in their own academic disciplines, I asked them to respond to various challenges put out by new scientists in one of its books. The book was called Does, uh, How Evolution Explains Everything About Life. So I took statements from that book and gave them to PhD scientists and in their field asked them to respond. And that 80-page book I commend to you. I've mentioned that evolution, in my perspective, from my point of view, is antithetical to the Christian message, the gospel. And I explain that in that book, Evolution and the Christian Faith. Maybe you think, well, yeah, I can see design in the world. It's a tremendous a design in human beings, but look at all the suffering in the world. There's these wars like in Ukraine, tsunamis, natural disasters, man's inhumanity to man. There's suffering on an enormous scale going back to the dawn of time. Where is God in this messed up world? Well, Roger Carswell's excellent little book, Where is God in the Messed Up World, answers that question. And he also deals with some of his own personal struggles along the way. So do explore the literature. Do stay around and chat and have fellowship afterwards. Come and talk to me. Is anyone, if anyone's got a burning question, for either myself and Gavin, we could just take two or three questions. Is that okay, Ray, right at the end? We don't, I'm not forcing it, but just in case someone wanted to ask a question publicly, we want to give that opportunity.